Welcome. Good morning. Um, we still have uh, colleagues joining us, but we'll make a start because um, we've got quite a lot planned for you uh, this morning. Uh, I'm Yata Fambole, uh, Chief Executive of the New Economics Foundation, and absolutely delighted to be chairing our discussion this morning. Um, you are joining us for the launch of uh, this fantastic book, which if you haven't bought it, I strongly recommend that you do. Uh, the Return of the State, Restructuring Britain for the Common Good. It's a huge contribution to the debate at a time when the fault lines and the vulnerabilities in our society and our economy have been exposed by the pandemic. And we have to chart a course to recovery to something better than the thing that we had before. The book has contributions from some of the leading thinking thinkers in the new economy space, who offer both an insightful and an incisive analysis of the problem, but critically bold, clear solutions for how we can respond. Over the next hour, we're going to take contributions for some of the key authors uh, in the book, and then we'll leave some time to have a conversation and to have some questions. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Patrick Allen, uh, who is one of the editors uh, of this and co-founder and chair of the Pro Progressive Economy Forum to kick us off. Patrick, over to you. Thank you, Mieta. And uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you for coming along to the launch of our new book, The Return of the State. Um, I want to explain briefly how we came to write it. In March 2020, the country entered the first lockdown as the pandemic took off. The government shut down whole areas of the economy and had to spend and borrow unprecedented amounts to keep businesses afloat and preserve jobs and to pay for health care and vaccines. So far, £372 billion has been spent on COVID-related measures. GDP is yet to recover and is still 99% below pre-pandemic pandemic levels. The big question was how the economy would cope with this shock when it already faced major challenges on multiple fronts. The consequences of Brexit, the cumulative effects of 11 years of austerity and combating the climate emergency. Any one of these would be a challenge, but four at once was an unprecedented moment for the country. 11 years of austerity has devastated public services, severely weakening all areas of public provision, and it's not over yet. There's been no reversal of the cuts and there will be more to come, apparently a 16 billion reduction in non-protected areas in the near future. So we decided to compile a book of essays from council members to show the nature of the current challenges, identify failures of policy, what should be done to produce a better economy. We found a publisher, the excellent Agenda Publishing with the extremely helpful Alison Helson. And in June, 2020, we signed the contract. In October, we handed over the manuscript and in February, it went to print. The book is dedicated to PEF council member John Weeks. John was a professor at SOAS, a brilliant and passionate economist who believed in macroeconomics as a force for good. He helped me to set up PEF in 2018 and he became the first coordinator of our council. He agreed to become one of the editors of the book but tragically died in Ju July 2020 when the book was underway. Jan Toporowski <laughs> Uh, stepped into John's shoes and became a co-editor with me and Sue Councilman, and Yang contributed an extra chapter to replace the one which John would have written. It was a struggle to complete this manuscript in such a short time frame, and I want to pay tribute to Sue and Yan, who were brilliant in all aspects of the editing, as well as writing their chapters, and also special thanks to Alison Housen of Agenda, who was supportive and helpful throughout. And of course, I thank all of our authors who produced their chapters with great speed and efficiency last summer. Actually, they couldn't go on holiday, so this kept them busy. Uh, so now to the book. It's intended to be a blueprint for the economy post-COVID, dealing with the challenges of austerity, Brexit and climate change. But we go further than this. We call time on the 40-year neoliberal experiment which has guided policy since 1979 with the intention of shrinking the state. The reduction of taxes on the wealthy, the sale of state assets, deregulation of banks and companies did not lead to an explosion of enterprise and growth. Instead, it led to instability and a great increase in inequality. We now see clearly that it has resulted in a corruption of capitalism tarnished by cronyism, rent extraction and the tendency to monopoly. The sell-off of national assets at knockdown prices is a disgrace, 
and the current owners now profiteer from monopoly products at our expense. Uh, we say that deregulation led to the 2008 crash, and this in turn led to austerity, poverty, and insecurity, which fueled the Brexit vote. Brexit is now causing massive harm to our export businesses and to peace in Northern Ireland and to the union with Scotland. All this the consequence of neoliberalism. However, the pandemic has revealed some big truths. We can spend billions of pounds when we have to, and the sky does not fall in. Only the state can organize the country to look after us in a national emergency. And the pandemic revealed the best of the state, the NHS COVID treatment of patients, the vaccination program, the research which led to the vaccine, and also show up the worst aspects of private enterprise, the cronyism in contracts from firms, many of whom failed to deliver as they had no experience in public health or procurement. And the 32 billion pounds spent on track and trace in the private sector for no discernible benefit, caused by a dogmatic refusal to use public health and local authority services. This money would be enough to properly fund the legal aid scheme for 50 years. And COVID revealed the damage of austerity that the NHS and care sector and local authority services have been severely weakened by years of underfunding. We challenge the whole concept of shrinking the state. Instead, our book is deliberately called The Return of the State. Only the state has the resources and ability to look after us in national emergencies. We saw this during World War II when the, the state found the money and organization to fight and win the war. We saw it after the 2008 crash when the state rescued the failed banks, and we've seen it again with the pandemic. But the state also plays a vital role in preventing crises from happening. If the state uses its borrowing and spending power and directs investment to organize all parts of the nation, it can prevent unemployment, re reduce poverty and create stability. We don't want the state to do everything, but to manage in the national interest. Failing to do this, means resources stay idle, poverty rises, and extremist pol politics flourish. This happened in the 1930s, and it may happen again. So in our book, we analyze what's gone wrong and attempt to provide solutions in all areas of the economy and in macro policy. We cover health, care, housing, education, public uh, company purpose, debt, pensions, and the international framework. We tackle poverty and inequality, and we call for the reform of benefits and a guaranteed income floor. We look at tax reform, what will happen to national debt and what a progressive recovery looks like. Just like after World War II, there should be no rush to pay back debt incurred in the pandemic. This can be resolved by future growth over a long time frame, especially with the low interest rates which now prevail. The plan will include a national investment bank and the creation of millions of green jobs, especially in care. There should be a regional policy for all areas of the country, not superficial le leveling up with projects directed at Tory marginals. There's never been a greater need for bold and innovative solutions for these times. Please read this book, join the debate about how we should change our economics. We're calling on all political parties to join the debate about the future of the economy. Together, we can agree the policies for a UK economy that's green, stable, equitable, free from poverty, eliminates food banks, and works for all citizens, not just a wealthy few. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Patrick. A brilliant introduction and overview of the book. Um, I'm going to hand straight over to Robert Skidelsi, who pro who's Professor Emeritus at Warwick University, award-winning biographer of John Maynard Keynes, cross Peer Bench, a cross, cross bench peer, sorry, a member of the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee. Uh, Robert, over to you. Good morning and thank you. Um, my, my chapter in this splendid book is called uh, Rentier Capitalism and the Role of Finance. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce it with a quotation from um, Sir Paul Tucker, uh, former Deputy Governor of the Bank of England. And he said in, 1920, in 2021, I've come to the view that it would be better to rely on fiscal policy to provide stimulus. Uh, Keynes in 1932, unless um, there is direct state intervention to promote and subsidize investment, uh, the slump will be interminable. Then another quote, Sam Woods, Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, 2017. 
if the Bank of England is to have regulatory autonomy, we must reduce the influence of geofinance, he said, a situation in which all the main banks in the world found themselves after the crash with each other's worthless derivatives. So compare Keynes, 1933, above all, let finance be primarily national. It's very uh, good that uh, the leaders of our economy are finally catching up with what Keynes was saying 80 or 90 years ago after their long detour in the wasteland of monetarism. But it's disturbing that they haven't changed their theories. Their common sense has got the better of them, but um, their logic remains very much as it always was. For example, Andy Bailey, uh, governor of the Bank of England said yesterday, um, that only two unprecedented shocks, that of 2008-9 and that of COVID-19, has forced the Bank of England into what looks suspiciously like financing the government's expanding budget deficit. But he implied that normal service should and would be resumed as soon as possible. Now, in, in my essay in this volume, I explain how Keynes came to endorse fiscalism as opposed to monetarism. <laughs> the crux of the matter, as he saw it, was that purely monetary operations like quantitative easing cannot keep the economy stable in view of the instability of the demand for money. Now, what does that mean? It's very simple. It means when trade is slack, uh, businessmen accumulate cash balances. When trade is active, they hasten to use all their resources in the business. So in a slump, you tend to get uh, banks and businesses just hoarding cash. And of course, that's happened since 2008, 2009. And that's why the recovery from the crash has been so anemic. The Bank of England website, you see, says, this is the current one, says, quantitative easing works by making it cheaper for households and businesses to borrow money encouraging spending. But I defy anyone to find a single large corporation which increases capital investment because as a result of QE, their effective interest rate has gone down from a very low level to an even lower level. And that means that the state of the economy and not the monetary conditions of the economy determine the quantity of money in circulation. Monetary policy can have a very limited effect only. The bottom line is that for money to affect the economy in a predictable way, it must be spent in a predictable way. And the only predictable spender is the government. That's the case for public investment. It's not only public investment, not only prevents serious slumps, as Patrick Allen said, but, but, but it's a much stronger counter cyclical tool than monetary policy. So that's the first bit. What about the second Keynes quote I started with? Let finance be national. He applied the same logic of hoarding um, to international money. It wasn't only private businesses within a nation which hoard money, but creditor nations in an international system. Creditor country hoarding imposes slump and deflation on debtor countries. That's what Keynes said. The debtor must borrow, the creditor is under no compulsion to lend. In turn, fear of debtor default causes financial crises. And the whereabouts, Keynes wrote, of the better old will shift with the speed of the magic carpet. Loose funds may sweep around the world, disorganizing steady business. And that's what happened in 2008, 2009. Um, and, and so Keynes, uh, and so, it, in order to avoid such disruptions, we got what happened in the 1930s. Country after country tried to cut themselves off from the international monetary and trading system. And the message of populism today is exactly the same. Our economic misfortunes are the result of globalization. We must gain, regain control over our own borders, say the nationalists. It was to avoid economic nationalism that Keynes devised his clearing union in 1944, which imposed a duty on the creditors, not a duty on the debtors, but a duty on the creditors. 
creditor countries which hoarded their surpluses would be fined. And if they continued, their excess balances at his International Clearing Bank would be confiscated and redistributed to the accounts of the debtor countries. An incredibly bold and radical move in, 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 in the context of orthodox banking practice. This plan, predictably, was not accepted. But for many years, the United States played the part of international lender the last resort. Today, we have no such international lender of last resort. So we have to sort of think of something else. Now, the challenge to the left is not, I think, to accept the idea of government as a public investor. I mean, I think that's common ground. Even, even you know, it's, it's becoming common ground uh, across the political spectrum. But it's to find ways of giving national governments fiscal space in a system of global finance. That is the issue. And the left um, needs to face up to that. It, it vehemently rejects the nationalist road and argues for a restructuring of the global economy on Labour's terms. And there's a very interesting essay by Jeff Tiley in, in, in this volume, in chapter four, when he discusses exactly what might be done in that direction. But on the whole, the left is short of ideas about how we can restructure the global economy in a way that is fair uh, and, and equitable. We still have this heavy bias in favor of creditor power in the global economy. And it is, and, and I don't know, I think this is, you know, the next step. Economics is global, but political legitimacy is national. The challenge of developing a feasible internationalism remains. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Robert. A powerful case for both fiscal policy and fiscal space. I'm now going to hand over to uh, Kate Pickett, who's a professor at York, uh, York University, co-author of The Spirit Level, um, a fantastic uh, piece on the benefits of inequality that has been hugely influential in the thinking of many. Kate, over to you. Thanks, Miata, and good morning, everybody. You know, I often find myself the lone epidemiologist surrounded by economists, but the past year has been rather different. Um, much of our policy has, has been dominated by the recommendations of infectious disease epidemiologists helping to, to keep us safe from the COVID pandemic. But my kind of epidemiology is social epidemiology. And Richard Wilkinson and I have spent you know, a number of years studying the impact of inequalities in income on physical and mental health, on human development and social relationships. And this kind of evidence you know, produced by social epidemiologists is critical to understanding the inequalities in health that were revealed by COVID and also the longer term impact of the lockdowns, the downturns and the economic depressions that, that will follow the pandemic. Socioeconomic and ethnic inequalities shaped the demography of COVID. Um, we saw increases in mental illness, increases in insecurities of income, employment of food and housing that were really stark and that, that show us the need for a, an inclusive recovery, a recovery that helps protect the health and well-being of everybody. And it's starting to become really apparent that more equal societies weathered this storm, this COVID storm, better than more unequal societies. So societies with lower levels of income inequality had fewer excess deaths. Now, we're not out of this pandemic yet, and it might be a little bit too soon to call in all of that evidence, but the trends are looking pretty robust. More equal societies had higher levels of trust and solidarity, and they've just proved more resilient. More unequal and authoritarian societies saw more illness and saw more death. And economic inequalities of income and of wealth and inequalities of power and their intersections with inequalities of gender and ethnicity and disability and more, they're not just a health issue. All of the problems that have social gradients that are worse at the bottom of society increase with more inequality. So as well as reduced life expectancy and more mortality, more deaths, 
we see more chronic disease, more obesity, more mental illness and worse child well-being. But we also see more violence, more homicides, more domestic violence, more child maltreatment, more bullying. We see more children and young people failing to attain what their capabilities um, would suggest they should in school. We saw, see more of them dropping out, lower social mobility, more teenage births, more drug and alcohol addiction, more gambling, more status consumption, more consumerism, and reductions in civic and cultural participation. All of these toxic effects of inequality affect our productivity and affect our economy and cost us hugely in economic as well as well-being terms. The countries that do well on all of these different kinds of health and social problems tend to do well on all of them. And the effects are large, you know, the differences between the more equal societies and the less equal societies are, are large. And everyone's affected, the poor the most, but all of us. So tackling inequality becomes a really central task in building back better and creating a better society for all of us. We entered the COVID-19 pandemic with all the characteristics of a vastly unequal country. How are we going to face the next one? Because there will be future pandemics and there will be other shocks um, and threats that we can't see currently, but how are we going to create a more resilient UK that will be able to weather those kinds of shocks better. And it's important that we remember that we're in the middle of other pandemics as well. It's not just the pandemic of COVID-19. We're in the middle of a pandemic of disease related to air pollution. We're in the middle of a pandemic of disease related to obesity, to climate change, to depression. So we have all of these threats to our health and well-being that tackling inequality will help us to, to avoid or weather better. If we're going to take the lessons of COVID-19 to heart, we need to get serious about reducing inequality. So in our chapter, Richard Wilkinson and I make six suggestions for policies that would help us tackle inequality and improve the health and well-being of everybody. And I'm just going to list them. If you want to know more about them, you're going to have to buy the book, I'm afraid, and, and read them in more detail. First, we would like to see the socioeconomic duty of the 2010 Equality Act enacted nationally. We have that piece of legislation there and ready that can go some way towards tackling inequality. We call for... Um, tackling wealth and top incomes with financial transaction taxes, wealth taxes and progressive income taxes, and boosting low incomes with universal basic income and a proper living wage. And other authors of essays within the book tackle these issues in, in more detail, including um, Stuart Lansley. We call for the promotion of fair work and economic democracy. And I think you will hear more about that from Will Hutton um, later in, in this presentation. We call for putting children and young people at the heart of an inclusive recovery, ending child poverty, ending selective education, properly funding comprehensive education, enshrining in law universal free school meals and free holiday meals for families on benefits and closing the digital divide. Um, there's further um, policy suggestions and discussion around inequalities in education in the book by Danny Dawling. We ask that well-being be put as the aim and objective of national economic policy instead of growth in GDP. We're not alone in calling for this. Well-being economics is a global movement. Scotland signed up, Wales has signed up. It's time for England to stop dragging its feet. And in fact, there's a petition out online at the moment that people can sign up if they would like to, to call on our government in Westminster to put well-being ahead of GDP. So please go and look for that um, and sign up. If I'm clever, I'll manage to put it in the chat later, but I might not. And finally, there were positive aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic. We saw an epidemic of solidarity in this country, actually, we saw an outbreak of people looking after their neighbours. 
working within their communities to look after one another, applauding and valorizing key workers who were helping to keep us safe. And I'm not just talking about NHS workers, but the people who took out our garbage, the people who stocked our supermarket shelves, all of those often low paid and looked down upon workers who actually keep our economy moving. If we build on those positive aspects, I think we can go a long way towards creating a grassroots movement for all of the positive changes that I'm suggesting. So finally, I think I'd just like to say that if the government wants to be led by the science and led by the evidence, then it needs to do better than it has done, not just over the past year, but over the past decade. From a government that claims to be always led by the science, we've had to put up with a great many years of austerity and cuts to public spending that were never evidence-based. They were never backed by scientific consensus. Public health researchers, practitioners, we've known for decades that poverty and inequality are at the heart of health and social problems, but we have been unable to get the attention or the commitment of politicians over the past 10 years. COVID-19 should focus our attention, change mindsets and shift political ground. And I hope it's gonna create the space and the consensus for a radical agenda for tackling inequality. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kate. A compelling case for making tackling inequality at the heart of the recovery. Um, I'm gonna move us on, but I'm gonna ask um, everyone to start putting questions that you have uh, coming out of the different presentations in the chat box so that we can have a good conversation um, after we've heard from all the speakers. Um, Will, I'm gonna hand over to you. Uh, Will is a best, uh, author of the best-selling book, uh, The State We're In, Observer Columnist, from 2015 to 2020, Principal of Hartford College, Hartford College, Oxford, and President Designate of the Academy of Social Sciences. Will, over to you. Thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm going to uh, my chapters calling for an ownership revolution. Uh, and I'm going to say just very briefly um, what should be obvious and should be at the heart of any progressive politics Socialists, social, de social Democrats, Greens, Lib Dems alike. And it's this, it is owners who shape the constitution of enterprise. And in consequence, firms' agility, their innovative capacity, their productivity. It's the character of ownership that confers trust and commitment between all the firm's stakeholders. It is owners who give the green light to investment, employee participation and voice, customer engagement, and the full acceptance of responsibilities to the environment. So there's no successful route to net zero by 2050 without an ownership revolution. There is no successful route to mapping our way out of COVID, to handling technological change, to lifting dire levels of productivity, and in my view, to managing the transition back to full membership of the European Union, rather than being left in the trading desert we now occupy without an ownership revolution. And I just wanna make a few points uh, before I uh, continue about capitalism. Uh, discussing capitalism and its character um, should be at the heart of progressive politics. Uh, and capitalism uh, is kind of meant to be about uh, the profit motive, the kind of lodestar of all economic activity. But I think uh, economic theory and our experience alike shows us how extremely difficult it is actually to be a profit maximizer in a world of um, profound risk, profound uncertainty, uh, differential power, um, differential access to information. And, and people running organizations, um, even public organizations know how very hard it is uh, to plan five, 10 years ahead if you just have profit as your lodestar Business models get challenged by new technologies, what to do. New competitors emerge, what to do. Staff have to be engaged and mobilized. If, you, if your people aren't kind of up for it, you're lost. Uh, new ideas have to be brought forward and they're gonna come forward from the warp and woof of the organization. Supply chains, distribution networks sorted. Our own, and there are claims on the company from all sides. And as one CEO in a, in a 
bunch of interviews I did recently and um, with purpose-driven organizations uh, kind of said, John Lewis, the CEO of Capita, these days you can't hide. Uh, so I, my argument is uh, that uh, uh, it's not profit um, that should drive organizations or narrow, divisions, never, narrow definitions of economic efficiency, it's purpose. Purpose provides strategic clarity. It's the social glue that holds an organization together. It engages people, it mobilizes people, it's something to get up for in the morning, it gives a compass and it provides an ethic when you have to take a tough decision that you do it uh, as far as possible uh, in the most humane way. And I'm arguing for, and the book argues for, an ownership revolution so that purpose becomes the founding principle, the North Star across the gamut of British companies. Uh, we need purpose to make, and when I talk about purpose, what I mean, uh, there are a number of companies which are already moving in this direction. So for example, Unilever makes its purpose to make sustainability commonplace. Infosys uh, says its purpose is to navigate the next. John Lewis says its purpose is about the happiness of all its members. Um, I want uh, every uh, company uh, across the gamut to put purpose in varying degrees at their heart. Um, so first, just to, what, what does this mean in practice? We need our publicly quoted companies to be driven by constitutionally entrenched purpose written into their articles association from which they derive their profits and to which all their shareholders uh, Inclu including their uh, all their stakeholders, including their shareholders, and I'm going to argue that actually one of our problems as a company, as a country, is that we have uh, so many variegated and diverse shareholders. It's very difficult to marshal them around an organising purpose. They need to be committed. Uh, Ed knows he was um, kind of uh, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors at the time when the last Labour government introduced a Companies Act in 2006 with a section, famously section 172, which is scarcely known about, but it's to promote, it's a constitutional obligation on companies to promote the success of the company for all its members as a whole. Um, that's been qualified by kind of, um, other aspects of company or law, which says, no, 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 no. Um, the point of the personal company, that's, that's uh, consequential, that's subordinate to actually being a profit maximizer. I think that needs clarifying. Uh, and I think the various, um, Kind of initiatives that have been taken over the last few years to try and make purpose live codified um, in a new Companies Act, which is what my chapter in the book calls for. Um, and there needs to be new reporting requirements. We need to find ways of getting shelters signed up. We need to find ways that kind of um, within the process of defining a company's purpose, an organization's purpose, the staff are engaged, unions are engaged in this process to produce a purpose statement on which actually stakeholders have a say. And I want to see a new asset class in the, in the London stock market of purposeful companies. That needs to be accompanied by, um, in the regulated industries, the kind of um, air, companies which we know exist to promote a benefit uh, fundamental to kind of life and limb, and which we um, regulate um, uh, off what water, off com, telecommunications, off gem, energy and gas, rail and bus. Uh, we need. Uh, all those companies, in my view, should not be um, nationalized, which will cost 250 billion. Um, but um, in each one of them, one should take, the government should take a one pound foundation share. And the, and the foundation share um, is the uh, uh, commitment process by which these companies um, reincorporate around a purpose to promote social benefit uh, as their prime activity as utilities or organizations providing goods um, that actually do promote social benefit. Um, and that, uh, that foundation share will permit um, the government to nominate um, um, directors, including um, if it chooses, uh, and I would recommend this, um, members of the workforce to sit on um, the boards of these companies to ensure that they actually deliver um, the, the benefit to which, to which they're signed up to and uh, do so over time, report on it. Um, don't do like, for example, Thames Water did as a privatized utility uh, until its ownership changed some, a year or two back, you know, simply used a kind of network of offshore tax havens from which uh, it kind of 
washed its profits to over deliver and re returns to shareholders and under invest kind of in the water system in the Thames Basin it was a disgrace. Um, so there should be another asset class alongside the uh, personal companies, public benefit companies. Our stock market would start to look very different. We need to break out of the monoculture of just PLCs. I'd like to see uh, many more um, uh, partnerships, employee-owned companies, mutuals, a scaling up of the cooperative movement, um, uh, and you know, uh, being populated by by new uh, um, uh, part, new partnerships, new cooperatives, and to make kind of tax system, regulatory system as kind of friendly as possible um, to their formation. I also think that uh, we need to look in the eye one of uh, a phenomenon which I think is extraordinarily important in contemporary capitalism, and that is actually what I call the privatization of the private. Um, private equity uh, and private equity 4.0, this new phenomenon of SPACs, um, kind of an anonymous pools of finance that are stalking global markets, you know, looking for companies to take out uh, and frankly asset strip. Uh, we have to protect ourselves. And I think that the law in requiring companies to incorporate around purpose uh, and all the transparency that flows from that should also apply to private equity. We take the private out of private equity. Those returns which are being kind of uh, narrowly delivered to uh, uh, the few people who have stakes in private equity um, need to be generalized so that pension funds and the public at large can invest in, the broad, in a broad gamut of companies and get the returns from them. So to do all this, we need uh, vastly large pools of dedicated capital to support um, the ownership revolution. Uh, our asset management industry is seven trillion pounds strong. Uh, it's a, it amazes me and has done for a car, most of my career that actually this is an area which does not get um, sufficient, for, in my view, kind of public debate, public examination. The returns are lush. What goes on is extraordinary. Um, they take their stewardship obligations to the companies in which they invest amazingly lightly. Um, it needs to be properly looked at. Um, for a start, kind of every asset management company should, like every other company, have to declare its purpose. Um, nor should they kind of um, delegate um, their responsibilities for kind of um, stewarding and owning the companies in which they invest. They should not um, um, subcontract key voting decisions to proxy agencies. Um, there should be, uh, we should uh, enlarge the possibilities um, of collective action. Um, we don't have in Britain, when you look at the, uh, who owns our companies, uh, in most advanced industrial democracies, uh, most companies are owned by, uh, the critical mass of shares are owned by four or five shareholders with whom a management team can have a dialogue about how to deliver purpose. We don't. Um, we have uh, this huge and diverse kind of ownership structures which allow kind of companies to be easily taken over. We are the takeover capital of the world. Um, we need to kind of get at that, look at that. Um, well, yeah. well we're, we're, running, we're, we're running close on time. So I'm gonna ask you to wrap up. Wrapping up now. So, I mean, I, and I, lastly, I want to see a kind of, and I, I've, um, kind of, uh, the introduction of sovereign and citizen wealth funds. Uh, the local government pension funds are being merged. They could be kind of pillars, kind of uh, ownership pillars of the ownership revolution. I think it's the precondition for achieving every worthwhile economic and social aim. And in a sense, kind of undergirds kind of what um, all my colleagues in the book are, are attempting to achieve. Thank you. Fantastic. Very clear uh, and compelling an ownership revolution. Businesses putting purpose at the heart of everything they do. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over now uh, to Anne Pettifall. Uh, Anne is a political economist, a director of Prime Economics and author of The Case for the Green New Deal. Anne. Thank you, Miata, and thank you also to Patrick and all my distinguished fellow council members of the Progressive Economy Forum. It's been an honor to be part of this constructive and ambitious project and this inspiring book. The book is about restructuring the British economy for the common good. That requires a restructuring of the state, um, a restructuring that ensures the taxpayer back state provides security for British taxpayers, citizens, security from poverty, unemployment, ignorance and pandemics, <clears throat> but also security from the gravest threat to face human civilization, climate breakdown and biodiversity collapse. To provide that security requires a reorientation of the state away from its current role in serving the interests of wealth, 
crudely the 1% towards serving the interests of crudely the 99%, broadly defined by Jeff Tiley in this book as labor in his chapter. Currently, the activities of the state are guided and oriented towards the interests of globalized markets, capital markets, and markets in goods and services. For example, the state provides markets in intangibles like software, apps, patents, copyrights, with legal protection and the enforcement of prices for those intangibles. If there were genuine free markets, the prices of the intangible assets of, for example, multinational pharmaceutical companies would be much lower. And today, poor people in low-income countries would have access to vaccines to tackle the pandemic. The state's protection of the intellectual property owned by, for example, Microsoft, Apple, and Amazon is what has made its owners fabulously, and its shareholders, so fabulously wealthy and has led to the rise of obscene levels of inequality, not just at home, but internationally. This is known as intellectual property monopoly capitalism. So today's capitalism has captured the services of the state, for example, the legal and judicial system for enforcing contracts, but also the great public good that is the monetary system to serve the interests of wealth. As Alan Greenspan, governor of the Federal Reserve, once argued, it really does not matter who is elected as president of the United States, because thanks to globalization, policy decisions in the United States have been largely replaced by global market forces. The world, he said, is governed by market forces. The result, as we have seen, is the failure of even powerful American presidents to affect policy in relation to vaccines. That policy is governed by market forces. My chapter argues that if we are to restructure the state, as uh, Robert Skidelsky so clearly argued in his contribution, we have to simultaneously restructure the international financial architecture. The reality is that today all states are embedded in governed by and subject to the international system of mobile, volatile, private financial markets. It is a system that has indebted and impoverished the many and raised political tensions as reflected in the rise of nationalism. Above all, it has weakened the ability of governments of the state to raise tax revenues from big, powerful Silicon Valley and other multinational monopoly corporations. That has led to fiscal imbalances at the national level, to deficits and rising public debt, and to global capital and also trade imbalances. It has led to the rise of strong men, authoritarian politicians, who offer the public protection from the very global markets that have stripped economies of jobs, income, and security while enriching rentier capitalists. We need a new internationalism, one that is based on the interests of labor worldwide and not of wealth. To reverse nationalism, to restore policy autonomy to governments, to restructure the domestic state for the common good requires the restoration of public authority, not private authority over the international system. In other words, the restoration of economic democracy in the international system. This must be done by restoring the state's ability to manage exchange rates, interest rates, and cross-border capital flows. And Robert Skidelsky has already outlined the importance of also having an independent uh, system for managing um, flows between countries. And that in turn can only be achieved by international cooperation to restore public authority over, the pri over private markets. I say more about this in my chapter in the book as a whole, has chapters which are really uh, contribute to this thesis. But I want to just end by confirming once again that if we are to reform and restructure the state at home, we have to reform and restructure the international financial system. Thank you. Fantastic, beautifully succinct. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, I'm going to move us on to uh, Martin uh, next. Um, and Martin, as many of you will know, is European economics uh, commentator for the FT. Martin, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Mieta, Patrick, and, and everyone else, uh, and congratulations on this project. I take it my role is to be the, the friendly but uh, skeptically constructive or constructively skeptical outside commentator. So that's what I will try to do. Um, I just want to start by observing that, that 
it, it was good to hear at the start the sort of genesis of the project. Um, congratulations on completing the book. Uh, but it strikes me that you started out as pioneers uh, and are very quickly at risk of being overtaken by this huge rush towards a return of the state. The state is returning, um, but everyone is now thinking about how the state is returning. Um, not about not about if whether it should, not about whether it should return, but how to make it work. Um, so I just want to point out this this paradox that you in the Progressive uh, Economy Forum, uh, you, you're sort of risking being out radicaled by uh, the IMF, for example, or the OECD or the White House. Uh, there are that everything is shifting. You know, maybe it's not quite right to say that it's to the left. But, but you know, as a shorthand, let's say that. So I think there's a there's a, a difficulty here in that I think uh, there's a challenge in staying relevant and not be drowned out by all the other voices kind of looking in the same direction, but maybe uh, with uh, with different purposes in mind or or different details in their recommendations. Uh, so I want to kind of strike a bit of a cautionary note. Uh, how does what you're uh, proposing in your many contributions uh, fit and how is it listened to and how can it be successful in this very, very new political and intellectual reality? Um, I have a few sort of more, more specific comments uh, that are partly focused on, on what was presented today, but of course the book is much wider. But, but again, you know, by way of sort of warning against pitfalls, I think. Uh, so one is we've had two presentations today focusing on the international system, and there are some other books, uh, some other chapters in the book focusing on that. Uh, I'm worried uh, that we can go too far in blaming international constraints for uh, a lack of success at the domestic level. Um, I personally think that there's a bit of learned helplessness around both on the right and on the left in terms of saying that globalization, whether financial or goods or migration, has made it impossible for the domestic state to be progressive. I simply don't think that's true. Let me give you one example from the last year, really, uh, the work to reform international corporate taxation. Um, that is going reasonably well, especially now with Biden in the White House uh, being back on board with this process. But it started because countries... Uh, first France, but also the UK said, well, actually, you know, we can tax digital global giants domestically. We will just introduce a turnover tax. We'll just do it. Uh, and it should have raised the question, well, why not five years ago? Why not 10 years ago? Why not 15 years ago? Not because it wasn't possible because of some structural problem with the legal juridical structure of globalization, but because nobody chose to do so. Uh, I think that's that's an example of how actually there are a lot of choices that can be made at the domestic level. Uh, and while there are many arguments for improving international economic governance, uh, it's dangerous, I think, to suggest that in the absence of those international reforms, we are stymied at the domestic level. So, so that's one pitfall. I think maybe a more constructive way of looking at the international scene is to notice that there are countries that have done better both in the last three, four decades and in handling COVID as, as came up in um, I think Kate's uh, remarks earlier. Um, you know, all these countries being in the same international structure by definition. So some of the Nordics, for example, have done better both in the past and in the current crisis. Um, at the same time, we know that there are other countries in Europe, for example, or let alone the US, uh, that have done as badly as the UK, pretty much uh, in the COVID crisis on the economy and on uh, excess deaths, uh, even though they have very different, for example, labor market structures or have had a very different approach to the privatization of public services, recurrent themes in the book. So maybe again, uh, be careful about uh, a too kind of UK shaped analysis of what the problem is, given that other countries with different institutional structures have ended up with very similar uh, outcomes or problems. Um, there are some specific things about the UK uh, that need to be addressed, but let's make sure that they're the right ones. 
Um, a, a third observation on where it's where, where it's easy to, to to fall into an intellectual trap uh, is I'd like to distinguish between institutions and policy choices. Uh, it's not true of all the chapters or all the presentations today, uh, but there's a tendency of you know doing what I think of the as the Brussels problem. If you see if you see a challenge, think of an institutional reform as the solution. Um, I think try not to go too far in that direction because it's not always clear that it's the institutions that are at fault rather than the choices we make within those institutions. Um, in the UK, uh, I would point in particular to uh, the simple issue of underfunding that comes out in many other presentations. Well, is that because the institutions need to be restructured or is it simply that the UK has never really wanted to have a large enough tax and revenue share of, of GDP. Now, today, this tax year will be one of the highest revenue to GDP ratios uh, in many decades, 36 point something. I just looked up the OBR figures. They predict going up to 39% within uh, the next few years. That will be the highest public revenue to GDP ratio the UK has had basically since the Second World War, except some exceptional years, but certainly as high as the average in the 70s or in the 60s. Um, so is this because of you know, institutions that have to be restructured? Or is it because there is something in the UK that means there's a limit to how much any government has wanted to tax? And if so, that really becomes a political problem, which I will sort of just pass the ball to Ed Miliband <laughs> to talk about in a second. Um, you know, let's look at look at look at the Biden White House. The problems in the U.S. are even bigger than in the U.K. That's true of uh, what has been going on for the last few decades, and it's true for COVID. Biden's solution has not been big institutional changes. It has simply been to put in place some really ambitious policy choices now, spending more, taxing more, putting a lot of public investment in. This is what he's trying to do. Just giving some more subsidies to families in particular, introducing a permanent, you know, it's basically a child benefit. You can think of it as universal basic income for families with children. Uh, you know, you know the list, you know, look at the three plans, but what they do not do is really a sort of institutional redesign that is, is a bit of a leitmotif in this volume. So who is going to be more successful? Well, I think we'll find out in the next few years, but at least let's have, uh, let's be open to the possibility that the Biden approach will be more productive. So you know, I, I don't want to sound too negative here. As I said, I thought my role was to be the constructively skeptical friend. Uh, it's not as if all of this is about institutional restructuring, and it's not as if some institutional restructuring isn't necessary. Uh, but I would like to highlight as most promising the direct policy proposals I see in this book. Um, Kate mentioned some uh, on inequality. What does it mean to, you know, I, I I'm much more interested in the direct concrete policy proposals of introducing a wealth tax and a basic income uh, than about what exactly it means to make the, the, inequal the inequality requirements in the law really work uh, at the national level. Uh, I'm much more uh, interested in how the government can simply spend money on public investment uh, than what it would mean to put in place legal reforms uh, for purpose-based companies. I'm, you know, I, I hear Will, but every time I hear people call for more purpose from business, I remember that Facebook has a purpose. Google has a purpose. These are purpose-driven companies and the world is not better off for it. So, you know, it really matters what the purpose is. Um, I think I will end there. Let me mention three things that I think deserve greater attention, you know, really a sentence and then I'll finish. Uh, I think there can be more focus, there is some, but there could be more on the regional aspect of economic growth and prosperity in the UK. That you, the UK really is an outlier in terms of regional inequality. On inequality, I think there needs to be greater attention paid to the difference between the sort of ultimate outcome of unequal incomes of wealth 
an inequality in the market in terms of productivity and how much people are paid before distribution, redistribution. And again, I pass this to Ed, who knows a lot about how difficult it is to make the term pre-distribution fly politically, but at least analytically, uh, we need to think about that. And finally, of course, all that's gone wrong over the last four decades is one thing, COVID is a second thing, but really the transition to the green economy uh, maybe should dwarf either of those in our analytical focus. And there is where bodies like the IMF may be stealing a march on you. Don't let that happen. Uh, so I just encourage you to, uh, you know, go be even more sort of thinking about the future uh, than you already are. But again, congratulations on a great volume. I'm just asking you to be more ambitious still. <clears throat> That is a brilliant challenge. Uh, to, to the radicals, be more ambitious. That's what we want to hear. Um, I'm going to move us uh, to Ed to kind of give final reflections and summary. Uh, Ed Miliband uh, needs no introduction. Uh, currently, uh, Shadow Secretary of State uh, for Bayes, um, former leader of the Labour Party, and has been thinking about both the structural challenges we face, but also how we respond for many years. Ed, over to you. Thank, thanks, Mieta, and um, thank you to this um, brilliant uh, panel and it's a pleasure to follow Martin who I thought was uh, a brilliant constructive um, critic so if his job was constructive critic I'm the sort of shallow politician uh, of trying to make sense of this learned uh, volume which I think is which I which I've read and really uh, enjoyed I, I want to make five related um, points the, the the first point is the sort of jumping off point really which is about the nature of the moment and the crises we face. And I think where the book is so correct is that the scale of the crises we face in terms of the inequality crisis, the climate crisis, indeed the, the recovery and the lessons from the pandemic are such that, that sort of incremental small politics can't answer the scale of the challenges that we um that we face, that we're, we're in such a different moment than the 1990s when we were in the middle of a long economic boom um, and uh, the, the, the nature of the, of the problems that progressive politics faced was so different. Um, and I think that is a really, really important starting off point, what I call Go Big. I've got a book coming out which tries to talk about these uh, issues. I think you see it with, with Biden um, and what Biden is doing. So, so, so firstly, uh, it, it, incrementalism can't answer the moment we face. And I think that's true uh, globally. Uh, secondly, what is at the core of change that this book is advocating? It seems to me that the core change, and it's in Patrick's introduction, it's actually threaded through all the chapters, is that we just, we need a new economic settlement for the country. But our economic settlement is neither equal, nor fair, nor productive. And in a sense, and uh, I can think, you know, Robert and others would be more expert on this than me. I can't help feeling that we're in a sort of, we are in a kind of interregnum, a post-2008 interregnum, that the sort of, that, 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 that what 2008 should have marked is the end of the old settlement, um, you know, 1979 to 2008. And the truth is that all of us in different ways are struggling for what this new settlement looks like. I, I think Will's chapter is, is outstandingly good, but I particularly mention it because it relates to my area. I mean, I think the two sides of this coin are we need to rewrite the rules of capitalism so that it is uh, less short termist, less extractive, more productive, more fair, uh, more long term. And we need to rethink the role of the state, which, of course, this book centrally argues for recognizing the, the, the kind of deep and wide role of the state in relation to what is loosely termed industrial policy, but I think is a too sort of minimal a view of what is really uh, required. And I mean that in the sort of broadest, I mean that in the broadest sense, because industrial policy for me is about the care sector as well as the car sector. It's about how does the state uh, provide the right framework, the right set of interventions to produce the kind of economy uh, we want to see. So secondly, at the core of this, um, uh, of this new settlement, uh, of the change we want, is a new, is a, is a new economic uh, settlement. Thirdly, I, I, want to, I want to 
uh, reflect Martin's point, which I think is really important to understand, uh, which is that this is now contested terrain. Um, and, you know, I do think that it's so interesting for me, you know, I was leader from 2010 to 2015. Obviously now I've come back into these contemporary debates more on the front line. It's just a completely different set of opponents in terms of rhetorically what they are espousing than at that time. Um, and, and, you know, you've seen it in the evolution from Cameron to May to Johnson in this country, but you've also seen it in Brexit, you've also seen it in Trump to an extent, which is that the right wants to talk the language of inequality, unfairness, and all of those issues. They don't say anymore, well, it's just essential. We need this kind of, these, these huge inequalities because they're essential for economic success. They now say, well, we, we the right want to do something about them as well. I actually think that is a, a big progressive opportunity. If you compare this to the 1980s, when Labour was out of power, the zeitgeist was, ex was extremely different. And I think this book very much speaks centrally to that, to that uh, change and that different, um, uh, that different terrain that we, are, um, that we are fighting on. That's the third point. Fourth point, how do progressives respond to this? And I think it's implicit in a number of chapters, but I think I want to bring out this point is that we've got to build, because we all want to see many of the book ideas in this book happen, but how do we make them happen? We've got to build coalitions for change, it seems to me. Um, coalitions for change with progressive business. And I actually think that the whole, I, I take some of what Martin said about purpose, you know, what does, what, you know, purpose kind of is a, is a loose concept. But I think the fact that you've got progressive business people espousing this agenda is a real opportunity for us. You know, if you think about the speech that Tony Danker, the CBI Director General gave a few months back now, about the need for a post-45 settlement. I think it is a straw in the wind about where business is situated. So coalitions for change with business, for the kind of uh, change that we need, uh, but also coalitions of change in terms of, for change in terms of voters. I mean, lots of people pose this dilemma for progressives, not just in Britain, but around the world. How can you keep the traditional um, voter in what, you know, working class, constituencies in the UK with your new middle class metropolitan voters. I'm not saying it's easy, but I do think that there are real answers in the economic change that both sets of voters want to see. I think that is, I, I was part of a report into the uh, Labour's election defeats, Labour Together report, and the central case that that made was there is a constituency for big economic change. And, and I, I continue to, to believe that. And um, you know, whether it is insecurity at work and, and the transference of risk to people or the need for proper social housing in this country or the, you know, the centrality of climate, which can unite metropolitan progressive voters with the need for good jobs at decent wages. I think there is an agenda, or the role of trade unions, by the way, um, which we haven't really talked about that much uh, in this modern economy, uh, you know, countering insecurity. I think all of those things can unite a, a set of uh, a set of progressive um, voters. So, so the terrain is contested, but I think coalitions can be built. But coalitions do need to be built. We need to be conscious of those uh, coalitions. Uh, last point is this, which is, I think about the na nature of sort of politics and what voters want to see in this era. And I think. I think in the end, voters do want to see conviction, actually. Um, people want to, people, you know, I think, I think we should all be quite um, chastened by not just the success of Trump in 2016, but how close he came to winning in 2020. I mean, Biden did beat Trump, obviously, but you had a, the horrendous situation of the pandemic. You had Trump having so appallingly, you know, mismanaged the situation to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of uh, people, and Biden only just squeaked home. Now, and he could easily have lost, let's be honest. Now, the question is, why was it so close? I think it's partly because Trump was speaking to a set of values. Now, some values which are hateful, 
but 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 he was also as continuing to espouse the economic discontent that many people felt and although he did not had done nothing to to address that economic discontent if anything the opposite people gave him credit because they thought well he does he does believe it's a problem and he does want to, he does he, he is trying to do something uh, about it now we can hate trump's solutions as i as i do but i think there is a lesson there about the sense of where you know where does this person stand does this person stand on my side does he get my sense of pain now i don't think trump did any sense get people's sense of pain but he did enough to make people think that that was um uh, uh, that, that was the case. Last point I just want to finish on is, is, is this, which is, I think there, this, and maybe this is a cautionary note for all of us um, on the sort of loosely the progressive side of politics, which is, which I think is a lesson from Johnson, which is we've got to be in the optimism business, not the miserableism business. Um, uh, you know, I, when I talk about climate, I sometimes say, um, you know, you've got to remember Martin Luther King didn't say, I have a nightmare. Um, and I think it is really important this, that, you know, whether it's on climate or on the um, economy we can create, we've got to be cognizant and speak empathetically to the problems that exist. But we've also got to be for the sunny uplands. We've also got to show how things can be better for people. And, and I think there is a fight on for, to see at the next election who can be the architects of change, because I think Johnson will be saying he's for change, not for the status quo. But there is also a fight on to see who can be the, who can be the bearers of optimism. And I think it's a, and, and I just say this partly self-cautionary, but just more generally, I think it's really, really important for us that we are the bearers of optimism, that things can be better, that that there are, there are really good grounds for thinking we can create a better society. That's what the Labour government did after 1945. That's what Roosevelt did uh, after the 1930s. And I think that's what we've got to do again. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ed. We've covered huge amounts of ground. And I think some of the big themes coming out of this is uh, you know, this is the time uh, for bold, not incrementalist polit uh, politics, because the scale of the challenge we face is huge. Uh, the case for fiscal space and fiscal policy, uh, the imperative of trying to reform the financial system, uh, the powerful case, I think, that Will made for an ownership revolution and business purpose within that. Um, and then this important thread that ran through this that I think Kate articulated so beautifully around the need to tackle inequality being at the heart of this. So lots for us to chew on. There are a, a number of questions that are already coming in. So I'm going to divvy these up as well as throw, I think some of the really insightful um, challenges that came from Martin. Uh, there's a question uh, from Alex uh, that says, do you think an independent or indeed a kind of more powerful Scotland and Wales pioneering well, well-being approaches could through their actions inspire people and leaders in the UK to follow suit and apply those approaches. Kate, I'll ask you to answer that question as well as Martin's point um, about the regional dimension um, and whether more focus ought to be put uh, on that uh, and whether that was an omission in the book. Um, I'm gonna ask Patrick and Robert to pick up the challenge that Martin made around do you risk being outflanked by the mainstream, uh, given the moves that we're seeing on investment, on fiscal policy? Um, is this still at the radical end? Um, I'm going to ask Anne and Will uh, to pick up the challenge around uh, that both Martin made and then Noel and the audience asked a related question, which is the international structure and the international order. Unless we reform that, are we constrained by what we can do domestically? Um, and Noel asked a very similar question that says, actually, is there no multinational or institution that can drive, help and inform the sorts of ideas that you're pushing? And does that create a problem for this agenda? Um, a final uh, question for uh, Will. Uh, I'm going to directly ask you to answer uh, Martin's challenge around purpose and the fact that all businesses have purpose. Uh, so is there enough traction and definition in this idea of purpose-led businesses being the key uh, to the reforms that we want to see? 
Um, and then finally, there is a question from Alan, uh, which I'm going to direct in part to Ed and to Patrick, which says, if you look at Johnson's Greenwich speech, um, it advocates less government, not more government. You know, there's a sense amongst us and the progressives that we've won the mainstream, we've won the argument that actually there is consensus now for more government. Um, and Alan's point is actually there's a really strong thread in the Conservative Party uh, that is ideologically wedded to small state. Um, do we think the politics has really changed? Um, if Patrick and Ed can sort of answer that. So around there for everyone and then we'll uh, come back if we have time for a second round. Can I start with Patrick? Oh, you're mute. Unmuted. Okay. Thanks, Miyata. I almost like the idea that we're being outflanked. Uh, for a start, um, I'm not saying we thought of it first, but uh, it's very nice the idea that other extremely powerful institutions are now starting to speak from the same um, hymn sheet. Um, but, uh, you know, that. Uh, we, we are coming up with uh, uh, radical solutions here uh, and uh, I'm delighted to now see that, that, that there is a possibility of some of these being put into practice. I mean, we, we can learn hugely from Biden and that's one of the things that, that must now be done. Uh, the, the Biden stimulus is massive. Uh, it's confident. Uh, they're not particularly worried about debt. Uh, the, the idea is to get the spending done immediately and have a huge uh, an instant effect. You know, the ambition to cut child poverty in America within a year is, is amazing. So uh, these are the things that we've got to learn. We, we've now got to, to uh, it's almost a showcase uh, for, the, for the kind of government intervention that we've been proposing and uh, it's, it's happening right now. So that's excellent. Um, sorry, Miata, what was the other, shall I leave it there? The second question, which is related, is has the politics really changed uh, when we've got a party in government, potentially, that is talking about, in rhetorical terms, maybe about more spending, but in some of their actions about uh, less uh, less uh, spending and smaller government and a really with a very strong ideological thread that is very much uh, wedded to some of the principles that underpin neoliberalism. Is the politics really rife for some of these ideas? Well, the, the politics here is tricky because the uh, the Conservatives are actually stealing quite a lot of, of uh, uh, Labour ideas. Uh, I mean, quite a lot of what was in the last manifesto is now being put into practice. Like the, uh, there is a kind of national investment bank. They're moving some activities of the Bank of England towards the north of England to give it a northern focus. And this whole idea of levelling up, uh, that's that levelling up is regional policy. Uh, which has been desperately needed for 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 years. So in a in a way, they're stealing um, the clothes of some of the uh, major proposals that we're being we're putting forward. So um, I, uh, I think the politics is is complicated, and uh, we don't want to be outflanked by that. But I I, I don't think uh, that the the small state uh, uh, it, 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 it is going to continue because it is quite clear that the the measure of the challenge is so enormous. The, the state's been forced to act. And that's not going to go away. And I think people can now realise just how important the state actions are and the challenges that we face. Thank you, Robert. Robert, you're on mute. You're on mute. You're still on mute, Robert. <laughs> Am I on mute? Yes. You're fine now. Sorry. Finally. Um, you know, I think it's very uh, difficult to get this point across that action depends on thought. Uh, we see language and thought shape the way we see the world. If we go on using the, world, the wrong language, then we'll act in emergencies. But as soon as that particular emergency is over, we will revert. And uh, when you look at what happened in, in you know, 1945, uh, the Attlee government, behind it was Keynes and behind that was Beveridge. M many other uh, sort of co contributions in social theory that had been germinating. So um, we've got to get the thought right. Take the investment bank. 
everyone now says, oh, we must have an investment bank. Why should we have an investment bank? What's the point of having an investment bank and a public investment bank? They say, oh, we must have a, we must have a much bigger role for the state. Why? Why can't the private sector do it? What we don't have is any critique, really. We, we've al almost progressives assume that that argument is over. Um, we have been persuaded in some way, and therefore we don't have to deal with it. I know, you know, I know the path of the theorist is very hard because no one likes theory. Success in English politics or any politics depends on, on leaving out the premises on which your arguments depend for fear that they'll, they'll frighten people. But, you know, we've got to make that effort. Thank you, Kate. Thanks. Well, I certainly hope that governments such as Wales and Scotland coming out as um, well-being economies will be inspirational um, and, and will help sort of spread that movement. They're one of um, five, there are now five self-declared well-being economies, New Zealand, Iceland um, and Finland, along with, with Wales and Scotland, all members of the well-being economy governments group, which is supported and set up by the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, of, wh of which I'm a trustee. And I think, I think they can be an inspiration because it's really helpful when, when good ideas stop being ideas and start being case studies or being examples and exemplars. And you can see things happening in different places that seem to be working. I mean, it's not that anywhere is perfect, um, but there are places in the world that do things differently to the UK or to, to England in particular. Um, and we can see different policies working well. And I think that helps to show us what's, what's possible what, what's feasible for us. And I think, I think that's really helpful. And I think it's important to note that it's devolution that's given Scotland and Wales, not just the ability, but also the confidence to do this. Regionally, we're seeing Greater Manchester making great strides towards um, putting well-being at the center of everything it's doing. I'm quite excited to see what Tracy Braben will do in West Yorkshire as the new mayor of the combined authority there. So inspiration from different nation states, inspiration from different regions, inspiration from different cities and local authorities in the UK and around the world, I think can really help us see how we can set our sights on, on a better place and that it isn't just all a utopia or a sort of a, a fantasy world that, that we're dreaming of. It's something that's real. Thank you, Anne. Thank you very much, Miata. I want to take up uh, Martin's um, challenge and argue that actually, no, we're not being outflanked by the IMF and the World Bank and the OECD. Uh, I, I mean, it is absolutely the case that all of those institutions have woken up to the political threat posed by an economic policy, the globalized, uh, the policy of globalization, which has led to the rise of nationalism. But that doesn't mean to say they've changed their spots. And, and if you have, want any evidence of that, all you have to do is go to Africa or to go to some indebted country to see how, uh, how hard it is now in the throes of a pandemic for poor countries to get a debt relief. But I think what I want to go back to is also the point about Biden. Like everyone else, I'm very excited, excited by Biden's radicalism and, and his optimism. I think it's wonderful. But the major beneficiary of Biden's stimulus is not going to be the United States. It's going to be China. Uh, because of the nature of the international system, there will be tremendous leakage. People will go out shopping for washing machines or for whatever it is that they need. Uh, <clears throat> and those are not going to be made in the United States. They're being made in China. <clears throat> so China is going to win from this and, unless we do something about the international order. So I think we are constrained and he will be constrained. I, I, I think it's and I'm, I'm all for the sunny uplands. I'm all for being popular optimistic and positive and it is thrilling that we've been able to see this transformation when we appeared to be on the brink of fascism in the United States. Uh, but I want us to be very realistic as well and honest with the public. You know, I mean, we've we've not been honest with the public about climate change. We've, you know, we've been pursuing the sunny uplands and, and, and now suddenly we're confronted by something that we're not prepared for. 
So I think we have to be, and I say this to Ed, I am absolutely, I am an optimist. I look always towards Roosevelt and the fact that Roosevelt transformed both the financial system, the international system, dismantled the gold standard, as well as tackling the dust bowl for inspiration. It, it shows we can do it, it can be done, it was done in the past, it can be done again. But we can't fool ourselves and we can't fool the pre- the public. We've been fooling the public that globalization was fine and all hunky dory. The public's understood that globalization has led to their insecurity, to their loss of income, to their loss of jobs and opportunities, to the the, the the inability of their children to go to universities or buy a home. The public are perfectly well aware of all that, and the politicians have to catch up with that too. Thank you. And then Will. Um, very quickly, I mean, I, um, uh, uh, I actually rather shared Martin's view that actually um, one doesn't want to uh, get uh, kind of stymied in one's ambitions domestically by thinking one has to solve everything internationally before you can move domestically. I really take that point. I do think, though, Martin, that uh, Biden has opened up uh, a kind of window. Um, you know, look at his moves on health, look at his moves on climate change. And look at his moves actually on taxes, where um, actually the FT reported only yesterday that Rishi Sunak was dragging his feet. Um, you know, there are kind of, there is scope um, uh, to do the kind of things actually that we advocate in the in the book. Um, to tell the truth, I'm more uh, if you look at to turn the domestic kind of arena. I mean, I mean, I think the state is back. I mean, I think one of the uh, things that you know we need to think hard about, especially in light of the National Audit Office's report this morning, kind of saying, is the British state up to kind of the challenges of uh, handling issues like the pandemic when it plainly isn't uh, of kind of domestic state capacity? Um, and that's one of the reasons why I why I do think that you know the ownership revolution is so important. In that you know you we you know you we have to have the state driving this, but you know state capacity is limited in any in any case, and you have to kind of harness the private sector. And actually to your kind of particular point about Google and, and Facebook, I mean, I say, wow. I mean, I, I, actually purpose has actually worked too well in both companies. Both founders protected their um, purpose by reserving to themselves um, more than a third of the voting rights. And, um, you know, I don't think, uh, you know, my God, have they, they've almost, I mean, purpose has over succeeded in both cases. Um, I mean, West, interestingly, kind of West Coast high tech kind of uh, um, capitalism is very motivated by purpose. Most people founding high tech companies actually kind of say, you know, I've got this brilliant idea, um, which I think is going to change the world um, for the better. And by the way, by doing it, I intend to make a lot of money. Purpose drives their profit. And by God, have the, I, I would argue they are proof positive of my case. Um, rather than a kind of challenge to my case, I think if Arm had been able to protect itself, a high tech company in the UK, got taken over, as you know, by SoftBank and then sold to NVIDIA, it was unable to protect itself, its purpose, in the same way as kind of um, the West Coast high tech multinationals. And look what's happened to it. So uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's, uh, I do think, just to finish off, that it's bloody hard running any organization in the public and the private sector. And one is why the BBC has been successful over time and actually um, NHS, um, so Gore, uh, uh, Simon Stevens and the Purpose Tapes kind of argues, uh, and I think he's right, that actually the purpose of the NHS constitutionally entrenched in the 2009 con- constitution that Andy Burnham introduced has actually been bloody helpful in guiding its handling with the pandemic, for example. Um, you know, prioritizing certain at-risk groups first, the elderly, and, with, and the efficiency with which it was able to do it was all driven by purpose. The BBC's kind of, kind of and strength over time is because, you know, it does understand its Rethian uh, kind of purpose principles. To have a not, if you want to run an organization well in the private or public sector, you need to know what you're about. It gives you strategic clarity. And from that, the rest follows. So um, I, I uh, and, you know, British capitalism is kind of, is kind of all over the shop. Um, and we, we um, re, ha, making this principle kind of underpinning it more than it currently does, would I have no doubt produce great benefits. Brilliant. Thank you, Will. And then um, I'm going to sort of hand over to Ed to wrap us up on the politics, but there's also an additional question that's been asked by uh, Liz. Uh, 
two questions. One is, you know, her argument is if you don't change the institutions, they can be rolled back by another government with a different bent. As to, to what extent are Labour committed to institutional change? Um, and she completely agrees with your point about optimism, but how do you marry that with showing sympathy to those that are left behind? And all in two minutes. Um, so uh, I'm def we're definitely up for institutional change. I really like um, some of the stuff Will was saying. The, there's this idea of the Better Business Act around. I think I think we do need this change. Uh, so I completely with Liz on this. Um, I don't think that it's that it's a sort of. I think the vote voters are up for this because. Look, people have seen what happened during this pandemic. People have seen the pay of that key workers, the underfunded public services and all that. Just to say something to Anne's point and then the point about the Tories. To Anne's point, I'm completely with you, Anne, and on telling the truth about climate and everything else. I, I'm absolutely not saying that. I guess what I'm saying is our analysis of what's wrong must be matched by a sense of, and this book does do it, uh, of what of the, of the world we can create. And then on the Tories, I just want to clarify, to be clear about my point on the Tories, they're not going to answer, in my view, the deep problems uh, that we face. But I think it is a sign that things have changed, that they feel they've got to talk about this agenda. They feel they've got to say they're for workers' rights, that they're for attacking the inequalities we face. Now, in a sense, as the way I think about this politically is, well, look, the fight is on. Progressives have to lay out their stall. The Tories can lay out their stall and then let's see who wins. But I don't. I, I think this is actually a cause for optimism because the fact that the, the fight is being, and, and you know, this is a shape-shifting government. They may work, they've got cuts penciled in on in terms of so-called unprotected departments and all of that. But the fact that the fight is on that terrain should give us optimism that this is a winnable fight because the fight is not being conducted on the traditional te terrain of the right. And if the question is, how can we tackle the deep inequalities and injustices that our country faces, then surely progressives uh, have the answer. And just to end on this point, which is I think the book is an incredibly useful addition to that body of knowledge and that debate. And so I'm really grateful to Patrick for having overseen it and to all of the people who've contributed to it. Brilliant. Thank you, Ed. And apologies, the question was from Stephanie, not from Liz. Um, I'm conscious of time and I want to hand over to Patrick to kind of close and reflect on everything he's heard. But a huge thank you from me to all the speakers and uh, to the fantastic contributions from uh, colleagues in the audience. Patrick. On the mute. Um, thank you so much, uh, Miasa, and uh, thank you. Thank you Ed, for your very kind remarks and uh, Martin for your constructive uh, criticism um, and to all our speakers for making really powerful statements. Um, I just wanted to share with you, I was very struck by something I read in The Guardian yesterday by Frances Ryan and she said, uh, in Britain a system leading to mass insecurity and hardship is presented as prudent and electable, whereas policies that dare to offer security and well-being are dismissed as unelectable and radical. And she says, it's not radical to want to treat all human beings decently, nor is it unelectable to try to build a society in the interests of the majority. So I go with that. And I, I, I would almost say that our, our policies aren't necessarily radical, they're sensible. We want sensible policies which work. Uh, and, um, and so in closing, I just say, uh, uh, read the book, let's have this debate. Uh, and we want to come out at the other end with a, with a new economics, uh, which uh, will win an election and then we'll, it will be implemented. That's the job in hand. Thank you.